In this lecture, we're going to return to the heat equation. We spent a lot of time deriving the heat equation and also building this method of separation of variables. And for the heat equation, we really saw the need for um, the theory of Fourier series. What we're going to do now is revisit the heat equation and formally solve um, the heat equation for initial temperature functions that can be expressed as, in terms of Fourier series. So that's the object, uh, the objective of this particular presentation. So, so in previous classes we looked at this kind of particular equation and here we had some sort of f of x, right? The initial temperature. Uh, remember the four, the coefficient four is just some constant related to the material of the bar. And for this particular um, problem, we came up with this solution, which is quite a, a strange looking solution, where the B sub n's are constants to be determined. Okay, if you can determine the, the constants B sub n, then you've solved the whole problem. Now, to get to here, we used these three equations. If you introduce the initial temperature condition just by going in here and putting in t equals zero and setting it equal to x, then this new bit of information and our understanding of Fourier series now gives us the power to compute the B sub n's. Okay? So, just to refresh your memory, I'm going to quickly go through the, the method. So in, in our, the problem that we'll solve is when f of x equals x here. So you've got a bar, in this case it's of length pi, which is a little bit unrealistic, but it, make, it means the um, working uh, is a bit neater. Uh, U represents the temperature at any point along the bar, x, and time t. You have some boundary conditions that tell you the temperature is zero at the ends of the bar. And this function, this function here is known as an initial temperature, which gives you the, you know, at any point along the bar at time t equals zero, you have some um, uh, knowledge of the temperature. So the idea is to Assume the PDE, or the solution, if you like, to the PDE, has a special form. The temperature is a function of position, big X of little x, times a function of time, big T of little t. And then what you do is you adjust that form by incorporating the boundary conditions, and right at the end, you employ the initial temperature. Okay? So, with this format, what you usually do with these problems is calculate the derivatives in your PDE. Here I've got u sub xx and u sub t. So you want to take this form and calculate the partials. And then substitute, okay? So, you would, so here would go here and here would go here. So you get this set up. Now what you can do is separate the variables. And our aim here is to form two ordinary differential equations that we know how to solve. Okay? Now, you can see the left hand side of this relationship only depends on position, little x. Whereas the right hand side only depends on time, little t. So, if you vary little x, you would expect this side to vary. But this side can't vary because it doesn't depend on little x. If you vary little t, you would expect this side to vary. But this side can't vary because it doesn't depend on little t. Right? So this format gives us the existence of a special constant, say gamma. 
called a separation constant. We can set these equal to gamma. So this really now is, is the key to forming two ODEs in, involving that gamma and then solving them. Okay, so if you rearrange these, you'll get two ODEs. The first one is, a, in this case, is a first order problem, which can just be, you can just write down the answer. And it involves an exponential. And the second one's a little trickier. You've got a second order linear homogeneous problem. Now, usually when we solve these kind of problems, we can solve these problems a number of different ways, but um, for this case, the most effective way is to write down the associated characteristic equation and then look at the roots, okay? So this is a reasonably simple e e equation to deal with, but we don't know whether gamma is positive, negative, or zero, and that, that's the next step of our analysis. All right, there are three cases to um, discuss. Let's just choose the simplest case, when gamma equals zero. Well, I mean, you can actually solve this problem directly when gamma equals zero, just by integrating, or you can think of it as the characteristic equation having real and equal roots. You get ax plus b, where a and b are constants. In the case where gamma is positive, well, if I solve that, I'll get roots that are real and unequal. We just form a linear combination of exponential functions. And the last case is when gamma is negative. So, um, you know, if you solve this, you'll get complex roots, and then it's just a, a, a complex roots with, with zero real part. In this case, it's just a linear combination of sine and cosine. So these are the three forms of this potential solution. And what we do is we try to determine the cases that give you a non-trivial solution, a non-zero solution. Okay, they're the ones we're interested in, the non-zero solution case. Okay. So let's um, introduce the boundary conditions here and here. And we'll try to determine which values of gamma give us non-trivial solutions. So that's the next step. All right. So... Hiding. So the boundary conditions four and five, mm -hmm. together with our assumed form of solution, give us big X of zero equals zero, big X of pi equals zero. Now you could argue that, well, what about the case when big T equals zero? Well, that gives us the zero solution. So we're not interested in that. That's a trivial solution. Okay, so we ignore the case big T equals zero. All right, so let's look at the case gamma equals zero. In this case, big X is this. And if you look at this, two boundary conditions, what do you see? Well, the first one gives you B equals zero. And the second one gives you big A equals zero. So if that's our form and big A and big B are zero, big X has got to be zero. So again, that gives us the trivial solution. We don't, we don't, we're not interested in that. Okay, so what this means is that we can ignore the case when the separation constant is zero. So we just, just forget about it. What about the case when gamma is positive? Well, when gamma is positive, if we look back to our little chart here, we get a linear combination of exponentials. So let's take this, use these two conditions, and see what pans out. Well, the, the left-hand endpoint and the right-hand endpoint, uh, sorry, the left-hand endpoint gives us a plus b equals zero, because we just have zero um, exponents. So a equals minus b. If I sub the right-hand endpoint in, I'll get some equation involving uh, big A and big B. Now, 
If I put this information into here, I can simplify a little bit and come up with the following. Now, this bottom line, the thing in brackets can never be zero unless, unless the separation constant, gamma is zero. But gamma is not zero in this case. We're discussing the case when gamma is positive. Okay? So, in this context, this thing in the brackets can never be zero. What's the other alternative? A equals zero. So if A equals zero, B's got to be zero, so what will our solution be? The trivial solution. Not interested in that. Okay? So we've discussed two of our three cases. The last case is when our separation constant is negative. And this is the, this is the good case, the non-trivial case. So if you use the um, boundary conditions again, then, oh, okay, you get that, that uh, A equals zero. But the right-hand condition gives us an equation like this. Now, one of two things can happen. Either big B is zero or the sign of this is zero. If big B is zero, then this is zero. The whole thing's zero, trivial. So forget about that. So let's consider the case when sign is zero. So think about the sine function. When is that zero? It's zero at pi, n pi, three, uh, sorry, pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, right? So we can form these sort of sequence of solutions. Okay? Now you can see the pi's cancel off. So essentially what I have now is a sequence of functions. Okay, so all I've done is I've gone up here, big A is zero, and I've replaced um, minus root gamma with n. And because this is um, a, a function of interest for each n, I need a special constant for each n. That's why the B sub n's there, because so, I need a constant B sub 1, B sub 2, B sub 3. Okay? So now, in, just out of this process, I've formed a sequence of um, uh, functions of interest. Okay, well, we can now return to this um, equation that we had on previous pages and just let's just replace, um, well, we can square both sides and so we'll get minus gamma equals n squared and then take the minus sign to the other side and replace gamma with minus n squared. So again, I can form a sequence of functions. So the C sub n's are a sequence of constants here. So let's take these two forms, multiply them together. Okay, so this form's um, uh, slightly up changed now to this form. I've now got a sequence of functions of interest. Okay, now because our PDE Okay, so just writing those out and just making this sort of simplification. Since our PDE and these boundary conditions are linear and homogeneous, then we can use a superposition rule. It says that if I've got all these, this sequence of solutions here, their sum is also a solution. So what I can do is sum up my sequence of functions, sequence of solutions, and form an infinite sum. There's an infinite value number of n here, so I need to form an infinite sum. Now, the last thing that we haven't used yet was the initial temperature function. Okay? We haven't used that information. We've used that, that, and that, but we haven't used that. Okay? So let, let's bring that in now. If I look here and just let t equal zero, well, the exponential will just become one. And I can just write down my f of x and my series. So the question was, how do you calculate the B sub n's from this relationship? Okay, well it depends on the form of, of your initial temperature. We saw that if the initial temperature is, you know, uh, uh, say a finite sum involving sine x, sine 2x, sine 3x, etc., right? then you can just 
equate the coefficients and come up with a solution. Fourier series is not, not required here. But what happens if your initial temperature function was something like this function here? Okay, what you would have to do is express your function in terms of this Fourier sine series and calculate the B sub n's. Okay? Well, I claim that this is, this is what, um, how, how you can actually calculate the B sub n's. And now we know why. Now we know why. Because, say I've got my temperature function. And I want to express it as a Fourier sine series. I would extend that temperature function as an odd function. And if I wanted to, I can make it periodic. So I can extend the temperature function outside of the bar, okay? Just so we can use Fourier series. We don't really care what's happening outside the bar, but to agree with the theory of Fourier series, let's just extend our temperature function. Then I can form, pr provided our, our f of x, you know, is uh, piecewise continuous, has a piecewise continuous derivative, I can form the B sub n's from this formula. Okay, so so now so this is now on the on the latest um, set of notes. Suppose I've got my temp my initial temperature function x. I can extend it as an odd function. So I'm I'm faced with this. I can extend my my temperature function as an odd function. So initially. Let's just go here. Okay, I can extend my function as an odd function. Let's just extend it like this. Okay. Now, I can also extend it as say, a periodic function. Now that function is piecewise continuous, and it does have a piecewise continuous derivative, so I've got no problem calculating the Fourier series. Okay? So how do I actually calculate the, the, the Fourier series? Well, I want the Fourier sine series, okay? Comes back to this relationship here. I want to express this initial temperature in terms of sine, in, in, uh, some Fourier sine series, okay? So if I do that and use the corresponding formulae, which I've, I've actually calculated in other lectures, I come up with this. So then what I can do is go back to my general form. Yeah. And just replace B sub n with this to get this. Now, these kind of problems do not always lead to Fourier sine series. Let me give you an example. If I changed these boundary conditions, so you had derivatives there with respect to x. It changes the analysis. Okay? So instead of having zero temperature on the, at the end of the bar, there's zero flow through the bar, through the ends of the bar. Now that, that might not seem like much, but actually it changes the problem a lot. You can repeat the analysis, and what you'll come up with is... Instead of something like this, so, so let's keep the initial temperature and sort of change those to u sub x and u sub x. If you go through and do the analysis, you'll end up with a, a cosine nx here. A cosine nx. So what would I do to this initial temperature if I wanted to write it as a Fourier cosine series? I wouldn't extend it as an odd function, 
I would extend it as an even function. Okay? And then use the um, formulae for the uh, Fourier cosine coefficients. Okay? So this, this kind of analysis, it's the, the separation of variables works for a lot of problems. But the boundary conditions and the initial temperature functions, um, if you slightly change them, you can change uh, the details of the analysis. Questions? Okay, so if, if you had, say, derivatives here and cosines here, what you would do is you extend that up like that and then form the Fourier cosine series. <laughs>